Good afternoon and welcome to the National Capital Planning Commission's October 1st open session meeting. First, Ms. Koster, can you please take the roll call? Yes, uh, Commissioner Trueblood? Here. Commissioner McMahon? I am here. Commissioner May? I am here. Commissioner Argo? Here. Commissioner White? Here. Commissioner Gallas? Here. Commissioner Wright? Here. Commissioner Dixon? Here. Commissioner Cash? Here. Commissioner Spino? Here. And Commissioner Ginsburg? Here. Uh, also present are Marcella Costa, uh, the Executive Director, and Schuyler, General Counsel, and Diane Sullivan, the Director of Urban Design and Plan Review. Wonderful. Well, uh, noting the presence of a quorum, I think we have a full house, actually. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Today's meeting is live streamed and will be available in a few days video on NCPC's website. If there's no objection, the agenda is adopted as the order of business. We will now play a short video clip of the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I'd also like to pause for a moment of silence for all of those affected by COVID-19 in our nation and around the world. In response to the COVID-19 guidance on public gatherings, NCPC will conduct its meetings online until the circumstances change. I want to share how we'll be conducting the Commission's business today. Votes by the Commission will be conducted by roll call. When Commissioners wish to be recognized, they should unmute, turn on their webcams, identify themselves, and request to be recognized. In general, please hold your questions until the end of a presentation, if at all possible. During Commission deliberations, I'll use a round robin format with a little twist today that we'll talk about. And I'll ask each commissioner if they have any questions or comments. During deliberations, I'd like to ask all commissioners to be on video during that time, unless you are experiencing technical issues. And for the discussion at, at the last meeting, I'll start with different commissioners during the round robin. So you have to be ready. Um, when you wish to put forward a motion, a second or an amendment, please unmute, identify yourself and make that motion. Ms. Coster now has a short uh, announcement about today's format. Yeah, thank you. Uh... Uh, Chairman Gallus, uh, Microsoft Teams, uh, which is the platform that we use for these online meetings, was experiencing difficulties worldwide yesterday. Um, and while uh, everything seems to be going just fine today and you were all able to join, um, if you do experience any problems during the meeting, uh, first uh, leave, try to rejoin the meeting um, through the Teams invitation. Um, if that doesn't work, um, go ahead and call in on the phone number that's provided with the team's um, invitation. Uh, if you can only join by phone, uh, commissioners, I have sent um, the slide decks uh, through the commission portal to you, so you can continue to listen and follow along uh, with the PowerPoints um, uh, if you have downloaded them from the portal. Um, I did send these uh, this backup strategy to you by email, um, and my hope is that the, me the meeting will proceed smoothly uh, and without a hitch, but uh, every day something interesting happens with technology, so 
we like to make sure you're as prepared as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Coster, and thanks to the entire technical team that's helping to make this happen today. And we know with all your worries about this that we'll just be fine today. We're counting on it. Um, before we uh, proceed with the rest of the agenda, in the absence of a chair, the commission must nominate and vote on who should run today's October meeting, which is the second agenda item. Is there a motion for someone to run this meeting? This is Paul McMahon. I nominate Mr. Gallus to run the meeting today. I'll second that. That's Commissioner May. Second that. Thank you. Uh, so um, a motion that I as vice chairman run our meeting today has been moved and seconded. Ms. Coster, can you please take the roll call and commissioners please respond by saying yes, no, or abstain. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Trueblood? Yes. Commissioner McMahon? Yes. Commissioner May? Yes. Commissioner Argo? Yes. Commissioner White? Yes. Commissioner Gallus? Yes. Commissioner Wright? Yes. Commissioner Dixon? Yes. Commissioner Cash? Yes. Commissioner Spino? Abstain. Commissioner Ginsburg? Yes. Um, All right, I think the ayes have it. Uh, one abstention. Correct. Right, Ms. Coster? That's correct. Okay, so thank you, fellow commissioners, for electing me to run today's online meeting. <laughs> Agenda item three is the report of the chairman. That's that's me today. Um, so I think this is our seventh virtual meeting, uh, which is uh, remarkable in so many ways. Uh, but I, it's just I just want to say I'm glad to see everybody, and happy that everyone is staying safe and healthy. Uh, and with that, let's move to agenda item four which is the report of the executive director, Mr. Acosta. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon. I have one personnel announcement to make. We are pleased to welcome Bisrat Bezgevi to our NCPC team. Bisrat will serve as a communication and research specialist within our Office of Public Engagement. She brings a wealth of private sector and trade association communications experience and holds degrees from University of Virginia, John Hopkins University, and New York University. So we welcome you aboard. And typically, I would ask you to stand at a real meeting, but you are on our video. So just say hello so everybody can beat you. Hi, everyone. We're pleased to have you here. Uh, you do have my written report in your packets, and I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Mr. Acosta, and welcome, Bizrat. We're very glad to have you on the team. Um, so next is agenda item five, is the legislative update. Ms. Schuyler? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I actually do have uh, three items I'm going to report upon, but before I do so, I would like to extend a thanks to Commissioner May. Believe it or not, there's been a flurry of activity on Capitol Hill relative to um, commemorative works, both existing and proposed, and he's been very helpful in making sure that everything we needed for you folks was on my radar. So the first item I want to report upon is a House Representative House of Representatives Bill 3349. This is the Texas Legation Memorial Act. It passed the House and, and was sent to the Senate on September 22nd of this year. This bill authorizes the Daughters of the Republic of Texas to establish the Republic of Texas Legation Memorial on federal land in the District of Columbia and its environs to commemorate and honor those individuals who as representatives of the Republic of Texas served in the District of Columbia as diplomats to the United States and made possible the annexation of Texas as the 28th state of the United States. The second item is House of Representatives Bill 3465. This bill authorizes the Foreign Journalist Memorial Foundation to establish a commemorative work in the District of Columbia and its environs and for other purposes. 
Um, the bill passed the House and was received in the Senate on September 22nd of this year. This bill authorizes the Foreign Journalists Memorial Foundation to establish a commemorative work on federal land in commemoration of America's commitment to the press as represented by journalists who sacrificed their lives in the line of work. The last item is a recent bill in, introduced in the Senate, S4564. This authorizes the location of a global war on terrorist, terrorism memorial on the mall at one of three locations, Constitution Gardens, West Potomac Park, and the John F. Kennedy hockey fields. It renders the memorial subject to the Commemorative Works Act, which means the commission will be reviewing it. It was introduced in the Senate on September 20th, excuse me, September 10th of this year, and it's identical to a bill that's in the House of Representatives that was introduced last year. That concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Schuyler. Um, sounds like a lot of activity. Thank you. Um, agenda item six is the consent calendar. There are five items on this month's consent calendar. The first item is for the final approval of the second amendment to the master plan for the Department of Homeland Security Headquarters consolidation at St. Elizabeth in Washington, D.C., as submitted by the General Services Administration. The second item is for approval of final site development plans for the Korean War Veterans Memorial Wall of Remembrance graphics package as submitted by the National Park Service. The third item is for approval of final site and building plans for the proposed entrance alterations at 726 Jackson Place Northwest in Washington, D.C., as submitted by the General Services Administration. The fourth item is for approval of preliminary site and building plans for the War Gaming Center, parking garage and area distribution node at Quantico, Virginia as submitted by the Department of Defense, Naval Facilities Engineering Command, Washington, D.C. And the last item is for approval of final site development plans for a photovoltaic facility and boiler conversion at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in Cheltenham, Maryland. This is submitted by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Are there any questions or discussion on the consent calendar items? Mr. Chairman? Yes, Commissioner May, please. Yes, um, I have a, first of all, I want to be clear that I will be voting in uh, for the consent calendar as you have read it, um, but I do want to make a statement about one of the projects, um, specifically uh, the uh, master plan for St. Elizabeth. So um, those, you know, for those who are not completely familiar with the many roles of the National Park Service, one is that we have uh, a role in uh, what happens with National Historic Landmarks like St. Elizabeth's. So uh, I just have a short statement to read. Uh, so the National Park Service remains concerned that the second master plan amendment weakens GSA's and DHS's commitment to the preservation and retaining of character of the National Historic Landmark and that its approval sets a precedent, precedent for again weakening preservation protections in future amendments. The mitigations proffered in the memorandum of agreement uh, do not do enough to advance the preservation of the remaining historic buildings and landscapes on the campus. Um, the National Parks Park Service would like to hope that we can see some concrete steps taken in the uh, near future to indicate that GSA and DHS understand the urgency of finding uses for and committing money uh, <clears throat> toward the rehabilitation and reuse of the historic buildings on campus. So again, I'll vote in favor, but we just remain concerned. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. May. I appreciate that feedback. Um, are there any other questions or discussion on the consent calendar items? All right, then uh, can we have a motion to uh, accept the consent calendar items? So moved. This is Commissioner Wright. And is there a second? Second. This is Commissioner White. Thank you. So there, the motion has been moved and seconded. Uh, Ms. Coster, can you please 
confirm the motion and the second and take the vote by roll call. And commissioners, let me just remind you to please say yes, no, or abstain. Uh, thank you. Uh, the motion was made by Commissioner Wright, Commissioner White. And with that, I will ask uh, Commissioner Trueblood for your vote. Yes. Commissioner McMahon. Yes. Commissioner May. Yes. Commissioner Argo. Yes. Commissioner White. Yes. Commissioner Gallus. Yes. Commissioner Wright. Yes. Commissioner Dixon. Yes. Commissioner Cash. Yes. Commissioner Spino. Abstain. Commissioner Ginsburg. Yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, that was uh, one abstention. All other members voting yes. Well, thank you. The, the motion has carried. Okay. Um, so let's move on to uh, the uh, open agenda. Uh, item number 7A, which is for the preliminary site and building plans for the Mariner S. Eccles and Federal Reserve Board East Building Renovations and Expansion. And Ms. Sullivan will make the presentation. Thank you. Can you see my screen and hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, I need to move this. Okay, good afternoon, commissioners. The Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System has submitted plans for preliminary approval to renovate and expand the Mariner S. Eccles Building at 2051 Constitution Avenue Northwest and to renovate and construct an addition on the Federal Reserve Board East Building at 1951 Constitution Avenue. The proposed project is needed to address a critical backlog of upgrades, reduce lease space, uh, and accommodate the growing needs of the board and its visitors. As a reminder, both buildings are located on Constitution Avenue Northwest in downtown Washington across from the National Mall. Zooming in more closely, you can see the Eccles and FRB East buildings. Directly to the north is the Martin Building, also owned by the board, which is currently undergoing rehabilitation. At preliminary review, the commission evaluates the applicant's approach to the building landscape and streetscape design, impacts to key views, and how the project will meet important transportation goals. The commission last reviewed the project as a concept submission in December of 2019. At concept review, the commission commented on several alternatives under consideration. The current submission for preliminary review includes more detailed plans for the preferred alternative in addition to a transportation management plan. Similar to the other buildings along this stretch of Constitution Avenue, both the Eccles and FRB East buildings have extensive front lawns on the south side of the buildings with historic ceremonial entrances across from the mall. Here are a few photographs of the Eccles building. Below you can see images of the east courtyard of the building with its historic fountain. The Eccles Building was listed in the DC Inventory of Historic Sites in 1964. Although it has not been formally evaluated for listing in the National Register of Historic Places, the board and consulting parties are treating the property as eligible. The board currently has a workforce of approximately 3,400 employees. They are consolidating their workforce into the Martin, Eccles, FRB East, and 1709 New York Avenue buildings, which are all owned by the Federal Reserve. Here are some of the photos of existing conditions, including one of the two original fountains, the sidewalk along Constitution Avenue, and the historic courtyard gate. The FRB East Building was listed in the DC Inventory of Historic Sites and the National Register of Historic Places in 2007. From left to right, you can see the building's east terrace, a view of the northeast corner, and the center wing outlined in yellow. As we shared during the concept review, the board and their design team began meeting agency stakeholders in the spring of 2019 to discuss the project and begin reviewing design options. We have convened often since the project began and the board has held four Section 106 consulting party meetings to date. NCPC staff commends the board for fully engaging partner federal agencies and the Section 106 consulting parties through the evolution of the design process and for a thorough and responsive submission. 
The key elements that have advanced since concept review in 2019 include development of the Eccles Building infill, skylights and atriums, the FRB East Building addition, the landscape plan, the perimeter security design and development of the transportation management plan. I'll discuss the submission and changes organized around the following topics, beginning with changes to the massing and design. Since December, the applicant has continued to refine the design of preferred option B, which includes skylights over the Eccles building courtyards, infill additions, and a five-story addition to the back of the FRB East building. Both buildings will be modernized while maintaining as much of the original materials as possible. Here you can see a better rendering of the specific changes. Starting with the Eccles building, you can see the five-story infill additions that will be constructed on the east and west sides of the building to connect the existing north and south wings. The new rooftop addition on the north wing that will connect with the east and west infill additions and the skylights over the existing courtyards. I'll also note the board is removing all parking from underneath this building and converting it to program space. And for the FRB East building, the board proposes a major addition that is five levels above grade and four levels below grade on the north side of the existing building, an atrium between the existing building and the new addition, and a 318 space parking garage constructed below the south lawn of the FRB East building and 20th Streets Northwest. During concept review, the commission requested that the board submit elevations and renderings showing the exterior design treatments for both the Eccles and the FRB East building additions, as well as massing options for the Eccles building related to the penthouse additions and skylights, particularly on the south side, which they have done. One of the most important design issues the team has evaluated since concept review is the location of the Eccles building skylights and penthouse over the courtyards. There are several historic features on the fifth floor of the building inside the courtyard area, including the cornice and intricate railing detailing, as you see here, and also shown here. Initially, the design team looked at locating the skylight at level four, which would not have been visible from Constitution Avenue. However, it would have impacted uh, the historic features. The team also looked at elevating the skylight to level five, but the size and location of the skylight at this location raised concern about its visibility. With the current submission, the skylight at level five has been pulled back to minimize its impact on views from Constitution Avenue. You'll also notice the proposed green roof in this building. A rendering. The section perspective shows a person's line of sight from across the street on Constitution Avenue. The top of the skylight, which I've shown in blue, would be just out of sight from this location. Looking at a rendering from 20th Street and Constitution Avenue above, the skylight is minimally visible through the trees and overall staff finds the skylight design for the Eccles building achieves a balance between minimizing views from Constitution Avenue and preserving the center pavilion's character defining features in the courtyards. However, there may be additional refinements that could further minimize its visibility from Constitution Avenue and staff requests the board continue to use the Section 106 process to evaluate the scale of the skylight and penthouse on impacts from views uh, from Constitution Avenue. The board also proposes to infill part of the courtyard entrances to connect the north and south wings, creating more usable space for employees. Here are renderings of the five story additions that will connect the north and south wings of the building as shown from 20th and 21st streets. The glass infill proposed for the Eccles building will maintain the original massing while connecting the. The infill additions are set back 15 feet from the main facades, which help the wings to appear as they did historically. The board is proposing sculpted vertical bronze shading fins to provide solar control and to reference the historic palette of decorative bronze of the existing building. And here in this facade diagram, you can see the cadence of the new windows and the infill reflects the proportions of the historic windows. With regard to the FRB East building, the board is proposing to construct a major addition that is five levels above grade and four levels below grade on the north side of the existing building. The center wing of the existing building shown to the left will be removed and an atrium will be constructed between the existing building and the new addition. The new addition will occupy the existing surface parking lot. These are renderings of the new addition from 19th and 20th streets. 
The addition to the FRB East building will respond to the existing architecture and will be clad in Georgia white marble, the same as the existing building. The mechanical penthouse has been minimized and placed to reduce views from Constitution Avenue. The main entry to the building will be located at the west side of the new addition on 20th Street. The board proposes a new raised mid block crossing that will connect to the main entrance of the Eccles building. Or, uh, there will also be an underground tunnel similar to the existing connection between the Eccles and Martin building. The existing operable aluminum windows will be replaced with high performance blast resistant fixed aluminum window units to match the appearance of the existing windows. You'll also notice with the exception of the corners, the historic building has a consistent base spacing of pilasters and window openings. The proposed glazing references the historic buildings pilasters and similar window openings. Two story openings similar to the historic building will be located between the pilasters to create a civic scale. You can see a facade diagram showing the continuing datum lines and cadence of the FRB East building. The board's design team has followed the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation concerning additions to historic buildings. Under this design approach, additions to historic buildings should be compatible to the historic building in terms of massing, scale, and architectural features, yet contemporary in expression so as to be differentiated from the historic building. Staff finds the design development of both buildings successfully responds to the existing architecture and creates additions and infills that are contemporary yet compatible to the historic buildings while exhibiting high quality civic design appropriate for buildings located on Constitution Avenue. Staff also requests that if rooftop antennas are anticipated, the board should submit a rooftop antenna plan showing the height and location of future antennas with appropriate setbacks and screening. In response to the Commission's previous request, the board provided a viewshed analysis. The analysis looked at several vantage points and in general, the new infill and additions are not visible from many vantage points along Constitution Avenue and the National Mall. I'll share just a few of the photo simulations. This is the view from Constitution Avenue. The existing condition is on the left and the proposed condition is on the right. Uh, it's clearly, it's very difficult to see uh, the proposed development in this from this view. The simulation is looking northeast from 21st and Constitution. This is where you can begin to see the infill addition of the Eccles building. Looking in the other direction from 17th Street and Constitution, it is difficult to see any change. And the same with 20th Street and Constitution. And of course, from 19th Street and Virginia Avenue, you can see the new addition to the FRB. B East building. Now, before I discuss the proposed landscape and perimeter security design, I want to touch on parking and transportation because it has implications for the landscape design. All three of the Federal Reserve buildings are located within the NCPC Central Employment Area, which is characterized by a high concentration of transit services, bicycle infrastructure, and a walkable active street network. As you can see, the location of the Federal Reserve campus indicated by the blue dot is closest to the foggy bottom and Farragut West Metro stations to the north. They are slightly over a half mile walk away. The NCPC parking ratio for this area recently increased to one space for every six people, uh, six employees with the final adoption of the transportation element update in July. However, the approved action stated that individual projects with a previous commission action under the 2016 policy, such as this one, would move forward using the 2016 transportation element, which means a one to five ratio within the CEA. You may recall in December, the board was proposing a one to 3.6 parking ratio for the Martin Eccles and FRB East buildings. In response to strong comments from uh, provided by NCPC and the District Department of Transportation, the board has decreased its proposed parking supply to meet the one to five ratio. This means that there will be 572 employee parking spaces between the Martin and FRB East building for 2,835 employees. There will not be any parking at the Eccles building. And while the project meets the one to five ratio, the board is committed to continuing their TMP strategies and introducing new ones to improve the overall ratio. 
Currently, they operate a robust shuttle program to Metro and offer transit subsidies and flexible schedules. They are proposing a large bike storage area and showers for employees, in addition to racks outside the building for visitors. And they will make use of what the Washington Council of Government's Commuter Connections Program and the district's Go DC Go program. The reduction in parking spaces means the board will uh, that the board will no longer need the fourth level of parking below grade at the FRB East building. The black dotted line indicates the extent of the parking garage below the lawn. The fourth level will now be repurposed and may hold law enforcement training and warehousing in the future, and there will be no vehicular access to this space. The parking under the pedestrian tunnel of 20th Street will be for the governors, their security detail, and the board's motor pool. NCPC has jurisdiction over the area under the right of way. However, the board must still coordinate all right of way improvements with the District Department of Transportation and the Public Space Committee. The board evaluated five different locations for the entry and exit parking ramps at the FRB East building. The preferred location consists of parking and loading off 19th Street and the parking garage exit ramp off of 20th Street. Staff finds that these locations result in the least amount of impact to the historic building by not altering the building and front, lawn, front lawn's appearance from Constitution Avenue. However, there are still outstanding issues with regard to the location of curb cuts and proposed ramp width that need to be resolved with the district. You can see in this rendering the 20th Street ramp avoids the historic terrace. However, as a result, it will extend into public space. Staff finds the resulting wall from the descending ramp will create an unwelcoming pedestrian experience and recommends the board add a landscape buffer to soften its appearance. Last week, the Public Space Committee gave conceptual approval for the location of the curb cuts. However, they acknowledge further work is needed with regard to the ramp size, the wall, and bicycle access. Now the proposed uh, building additions and renovations will necessitate changes to the landscape of both buildings. The board has completed a draft cultural landscape report and assessment of effects, noting several character defining features of the landscapes for both buildings. With regard to the Eccles landscape, examples of the character defining features include the lawn and garden terraces that raise the building above street level, the symmetrical design of the overall site, the central walkway, marble steps, and monumental stairs, the spe DC special and heritage trees, and the fountains, granite walls, and marble benches. Staff finds the Echoes landscape designed by Paul Cray with a specific intent should be retained as much as possible. Staff finds that the proposed design for the Echoes landscape preserves several of these character defining features while creating universally accept accessible routes, improving perimeter security, and modifying a portion of the fountain gardens. The proposed design retains a symmetrical site layout with gardens and a fountain on each side of the central walk, includes new sloped walks to access the lawn and garden terrace from the southwest and southeast corners, proposes two bioretention areas south of the marble walkway in place of the row of magnolia trees that will be removed to help satisfy stormwater requirements. I'll note that the magnolias are not considered a character defining feature. To maintain consistency with the historic views from Constitution Avenue, an evergreen hedge will be installed surrounding the bioretention areas as shown here. Overall, staff finds the proposed design for the Eccles landscape largely protects the character defining features of the site while improving circulation and stormwater management. Now, the FRB East landscape consists of a classical symmetrical composition with a series of elevated terraces. Specific character defining features of the FRB East landscape include the central walkway, entrance plaza and steps, the building terrace, marble steps, bicolor paving and la uh, landing, the DC special trees, ivy beds and lamp posts and terrace walls. Staff finds that the FRB East landscape, historically less formal, uh, can support new features and greater alterations. Overall, staff finds the proposed landscape for the FRB East building reflects the symmetry of the historic design while addressing program needs related to creating a new main building entrance, improving universal accessibility and perimeter security. The design includes universally accessible routes via sloped walks at 19th Street, 20th Street, and a new ramp at the West Side Terrace. Much of the existing garden terrace within the limit of the new gar uh, garage will be completely demolished and reconstructed. 
Historic site and building materials will be salvaged, protected and cleaned and reinstalled. As you can see, the design process, uh, as you can see, the design proposes two lawn panels similar to what exists today, in addition to two, in addition to twin fountains, which were a part of the historic landscape plan for the garden, but they were never constructed. New large trees will also be planted in the garden areas. On the corner of 20th Street and C Street, the board proposes a new sunken outdoor terrace in the northwest corner of the site for employee use adjacent to the new entry. The terrace will be bordered by a linear water feature on the north side that faces south toward the lobby space. Here you can see a rendering of the new 20th Street entrance within the ramp stair with the ramp stairs and sunken terrace. One additional rendering here. The proposed planting design will include plants selected to thrive in the local regional site conditions and increase species diversity while retaining the character of the historic landscape uh, to the south of the buildings. There are several trees on the site that would classify as special or heritage trees per the district standards as shown in pink and purple. The design includes a tree preservation strategy that will seek to protect as many healthy existing trees as possible. That said, the board will need to remove some of the trees on site due to construction as shown here in the demolition excavation area. The heritage and special trees within the hatch blue lines at the southern area of the site uh, can be preserved. Removal and replacement of bollards will require replacement of the majority of street trees with the exception of very large trees along Constitution Avenue. Street trees not along Constitution Avenue will be replaced with five to six inch caliper trees. Large elm trees along Constitution Avenue that are not in good condition will be removed and replaced with 10 to 12 inch caliper trees. The board is committed to replanting in accordance with all DDOT requirements. Staff requests the board submit a tree replanting plan, including size, type, and location in accordance with NCPC's tree replacement policy for final review and recommends the board continue to coordinate with the District Department of Transportation and the Urban Forester. The board has submitted information on the strategy to achieve perimeter security around both uh, the Eccles and FRB East buildings. The existing bronze clad perimeter security system around the Eccles building will be replaced by a cable rail system similar to the one installed at the Department of Commerce. The board proposes the same cable rail system for the FRB East building. The site does not currently have any perimeter security. Currently, the perimeter security at the Eccles building is located within the sidewalk planting area along 20th and 21st streets at the property line on C Street and at the foot of the monumental stairs on Constitution Avenue. The location of perimeter security at the, FR, at the FRB East building will be the same. The proposed security elements will, consi uh, will be consistent for both buildings. They consist of either a post and rail system with an internal cable located in planting areas or simple individual bronze bollards at entry locations or where pedestrian circulation is required. The intent is to maximize the spacing between the posts, significantly reducing the visual impact compared to traditional bollards. In front of the Eccles building along Constitution Avenue, the existing marble walls will be retained in place and serve as anti-ram knee walls. And at the FRB East building along Constitution Avenue, the post and rail system will be set back about 15 feet from the north side of the sidewalk. Overall staff finds that the proposed perimeter security system is much improved with its simpler, more minimal design. The cable rail allows for fewer bollards with less impact on the trees, the tree zone. Staff also notes that additional consultation uh, is needed with the consulting parties on this issue. New air conditioned guard booths will replace the existing guard booths in the South Garden Terraces at the Eccles and FRB East buildings. Guard booths are also proposed at the east and west side of the FRB East building adjacent to the parking garage ramps. The board is still working on the proposed design of the guard booths, which they note will be sensitive to the landscape and historic buildings. Therefore, staff requests additional information and renderings for all of the guard booths at final review. And finally, staff uh, finds the perimeter security will not allow the public any access to the grounds and that the board should consider public access to some of the grounds such as the fountains or the northwest plaza of the FRB East building and or virtual tours of the buildings as potential mitigation in the section 106 process. 
Now the small triangle of land immediately to the north of the FRBE site is owned by the National Park Service. This triangle site could one day accommodate a small memorial. Construction related to the building addition will directly impact this property and the board is proposing several improvements for both uh, the NPS property and the adjacent right of way as mitigation. And here you can just see a few images of the property today. Construction will impact the area around the property line, which is shown in yellow. Uh, the board proposes to remove and plant a new row of trees and install a continuous planting buffer between the two sites as shown here. The row of trees would align with the trees along C Street, reinforcing the historic roadway alignment and framing views to future memorial sites. The board is also proposing to install a new east-west sidewalk. Staff requests that the board continue to coordinate all improvements with the National Park Service. The board has submitted an initial response to the commission's lighting requests, noting that exterior lighting will be updated across the site, including lighting for the building facades, vehicular and pedestrian access, and the streetscape. Landscape accent lighting would highlight garden features and complement plantings. Street lighting will meet DDOT and monumental core street standards. To more effectively illuminate the site uh, for aesthetic and security related reasons, the current exterior lighting along the Constitution Avenue frontage will be supplemented with building facade lighting for both buildings. The addition to the FRB East building will but will not have exterior lights for the building facade. Interior workplace lighting will be intermittently visible. The board notes that lighting levels will not be bright enough to spill out, nor will the addition have a glowing effect. The lighting control system will automatically turn off lights when spaces are unoccupied. Overall, the proposed lighting for both buildings will consist of warm and very warm white LEDs and will be tuned based on the time of night. Staff requests the board submit an exterior lighting plan and diagram for the grounds and building facades at final review. The wayfinding strategy is currently under development. The board's goal is to develop a strategy that emphasizes the Federal Reserve's civic importance. Exterior signage will use contemporary materials and processes that respect the historic features of each building while creating a more unified appearance and signage system throughout the campus. Overall, staff supports the board's approach to signage and wayfinding and finds the proposed strategy will create a more unified appearance and signage system. Staff requests a more detailed wayfinding plan at final review. And finally, with regard to next steps, the Section 106 and NEPA processes are ongoing, and as a result, there may be additional modifications to the design between preliminary and final review. Staff requests additional coordination with all consulting parties regarding the proposed design, landscaping plan, lighting, and perimeter security. A Section 106 memorandum of agreement will be executed to address agreed upon mitigation measures commensurate with adverse effects resulting from the project. The Federal Reserve Board has prepared a draft environmental assessment, which is available for public comment uh, until October 12th. And lastly, the board anticipate, anticipates submitting for final review in the spring of 2021. So that concludes my presentation. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go through the recommendations again, but they are here for your reference. Uh, members from the Federal Reserve Board and the design team are available to answer questions. And with that, I will turn it over to Jeff Fultz with the Federal Reserve Board, who would like to say a few remarks. Good afternoon, as Diane mentioned. My name is Jeff Fultz, Chairman Gallus and Commission members. On behalf of the Federal Reserve Board, thank you for allowing us to present this afternoon. As you know, this is a large and complex project that is crucial to the board as we implement our long range space plan. While we haven't been able to meet face to face recently, the expertise and cooperation of your staff has been invaluable in helping us progress our project and in refining our renovation and expansion plans. Since our concept review last December, we have worked hard to engage our other federal agency partners and we'll continue to do so moving forward. We're extremely excited about this project and I have some key members of our design team with me today and we're prepared to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. All right, well, thank you, Ms. Sullivan and Mr. Fultz. Uh, that was, that's quite a tour de force. Uh, uh, presentation and uh, and work by the team. 
I think before we begin any commission discussion, uh, do any of the commissioners have any questions for staff or the applicant to clarify anything that you've seen today? Perhaps, Ms. Sullivan, if you could take down the uh, presentation now, that would be great. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, I'm, uh, Commissioner Argo, I'm going to start with you. So let's open it up to the commission. Uh, we'll start with Commissioner Argo, and then we'll go in a round robin format uh, using our normal seating order from left to right from Commissioner Argo. So. Uh, next, we'll, we'll be calling on Commissioner White, so giving a little heads up here, and then we'll circle around the way we normally see. Um, so go ahead, Commissioner Argo. Well, thank you. I don't mind going first, since um, uh, I don't have a lot to say, except I, I've been, um, I have been and remain um, impressed with all the work that has gone into this. I recall our visit um, to these properties and have probably more of an appreciation having been able to visit both the interior and um, exterior uh, and share the exterior views of these properties. I think um, the design team uh, has, has really done an outstanding job of um, modernizing, uh, bringing in the kind of um, uh, additional uh, space and um, all the landscaping work, everything. Um, it's It's been very impressive in the work that uh, the NCPC team has done to help um, guide that. Um, I'm also impressed with. So, that would be the core of my comments. Thank you, Commissioner Argo. Uh, let's go to Commissioner White. Thank you. Um, well, I would echo uh, Commissioner Argo's comments and add that um, I too am very grateful that we had to we had the opportunity to do the site visit when we did, so we understand these um, important. Uh, what may seem like nuances to a lot of people, but these design elements being retained and the the sensitivity of the solutions, I think, are really spot on. Um, I particularly like the restoration of things, which I actually didn't recall was in the original um, proposal. So I think that's a really nice touch, uh, along with the bioswales and the the way that the exterior of the building, um, while retaining the historical and architectural integrity really opens it up more for people to enjoy and um, feel the building is approachable. Um, but I think the thing that struck me um, as the most important and significant, and I want to express my appreciation for achieving the parking ratio goals, I think that is such an important gesture on the part of the Federal Reserve and um, signifying that you know change can happen when um, people take a look at what the greater goals are. So I'm, I'm very appreciative uh, for that alone, much less all the other improvements. So um, well done, Diane, to you and your team and the design team for working through those issues. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner White. Let's go to Commissioner Wright now. Okay. Um, I don't have I don't have a lot to add. I think this is an exquisite project. Um, uh, there's for me there's and it's not really a planning issue. It's a design issue, and I I would also like to congratulate the design team. The only sour note for me is a change they had they had to make in response to <clears throat> the review bodies, which I think was too bad, which is the uh, the new fenestration pattern for the addition to, um, I keep thinking of it as South Interior, but you know what I'm saying, the second building. Um, Never be East. Thank you. Um, 
I I think an earlier iteration was better, but but given the response, it's as good as it can be. Um, I I think it's going to be a lovely place to work. Um, I have nothing to add. Thank you, Commissioner Wright. Uh, Commissioner Dixon, go ahead. Oh, uh, great job, Echo. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Dixon. Commissioner Cash. Well, I think the, the overall planning design is, is really great. And uh, again, I want to thank, just like everyone else has, uh, to have, having us out there. I think it, it helped uh, gain a lot of context for the site. Uh, I do want to bring up some concerns I have about the, uh, the trees on the site. Um, so, I mean, I've spent a lot of time looking at these, these couple of slides that, that are in our uh, presentation that show all the heritage trees and the special trees. I will note that in so on the slides that we have, it was 41, but it has like all the pink trees and the blue trees. And I will note that the uh, the descriptor for a heritage tree and a special tree are backwards on there. So the heritage trees are the ones that are over 100 inches, and the special trees are under 100 inches. Um, but with that said, I see a lot of orange and red dots on the trees that are outside of the uh, excavation line, and that really gives me a lot of concern that we're going to lose once again a lot of great big old heritage trees. And I think that. Um, in finalizing the tree plan that's being called for, I think that an arborist should really take a second look because I noticed in the uh, the description that they're, it's saying that a lot of the trees are not necessarily healthy. And I mean, just walking around the site, it didn't seem that bad. So I would really just urge the team to really preserve as many of these trees as possible because I'm starting to feel like on some of these uh, projects that we've read lately, we've kind of gotten burned. So outside of my window, I can see the World War One Memorial site. There are literally seven trees left on that site. Everything else has been taken out, and I don't remember that being kind of one of the big parts of the plan. Um, looking at Franklin Park, I mean, the, the numbers that were in the report seem to indicate a lot more trees would be preserved, and I guess I didn't realize they were counting the ones along 14th Street Roadway. So um, I just want to make sure that, that we're not going to to let too many of these trees that don't have to be otherwise removed. I'd like to be able to preserve as many of these as possible, especially on the uh, FRB East building. There's a lot of excavations going to go on. And just because that is going to be a parking lot, there's going to be concerns there. And I would also say that for as many of these trees that have to be removed, um, the DC law requires in, in whatever case you, you have to remove one of these trees, if it's still healthy, that in all cases it'd be relocated somewhere else if it's at all feasible. So I'd really urge the team to, I mean, you're, you probably don't have to, to go by DC law to the letter of the law, just given it's a federal project, but I'd really encourage the team to find ways to replace these trees with, with something as mature as possible when there's a healthy tree that has to be removed to, to find some other place to put it or, or um, finding some other property or way to preserve it. So, um, but other than the trees, I think that, that the team's done a great job and I, I really appreciate the design work. Thank you, Commissioner Cash. Um, let's go now to Commissioner uh, Spino, please. Thank you. Um, I have no comments and just appreciate the work. Thank you, Commissioner Spino. Commissioner Ginsburg. I also have no comments and appreciate the work. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Trueblood. Uh, and, and thanks to the team for, for presenting. Um, I, I have no substantive comments other than to underline, I think, some uh, points that Ms. Sullivan made around. Uh, I know there's some ongoing work uh, around kind of some of the historic preservation matters, uh, the view of, of the skylight, uh, roof addition, um, landscape treatments, and the, the parking garage access ramp, which I know is also um, as, as was mentioned, there's some comments at the space committee about the width of that. I think these are all things that, um, you know, I agree with the comments and I, I know they will, they are matters that can be worked out on such a major project. I would say the major pieces of this have, have been, uh, you know, well uh, treated. The, I, I would also support uh, what Commissioner Cash said around trees. I feel like, um, you know, we have high ambitions. It's sort of like parking, which I, and I appreciate the parking movement. I do appreciate the parking movement. Um, I think we have very strong ambitions around tree um, preservation and tree canopy. Uh, it seems like we often fall short of that. Um, and, uh, you know, some of that is the reality of construction and some of that is what we want versus at the end of the day, what's easy to do. Um, so, you know, I, I think we can just continue to 
to, to kind of make that point. Uh, it's hard to preserve a tree. It's hard to preserve tree canopy or create tree canopy. Um, and so that it's hard. It's hard. It can be expensive. It can be time consuming. Um, but I think our job is to push for those things. Uh, so I just uh, support what Commissioner Cash said on that. Thank you, Commissioner Thank you. Trueblood. Uh, let's go now to Commissioner McMahon. Thank you, sir. Now, um, great work. Appreciate the efforts of uh, NCPC staff to work with uh, the board to pull this together and uh, Happy to see a great product. I have no other comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner May. Uh, sure, I have a, uh, a few brief comments. Um, so um, I agree with many much of what has been said before. I think the design is uh, really uh, has come along uh, very well. Um, and uh, I, I certainly do appreciate that, uh, particularly given uh, the rough ride that has already occurred in the development of the design uh, in the Commission of Fine Arts reviews, because I, I watched the very first one, but I didn't see all the, the all of the rest of them. But uh, it's not been a, uh, necessarily an easy um, uh, path to developing the design, but I think that the uh, design team has done a, a really good job. Um, I don't recall any of the interim designs of FRBE, so I don't know if what we wound up with is any uh, better or worse, as um, uh, uh, Commissioner Wright uh, mentioned, um, I think what we have now is is um, is very good. So um, I also think that you know overall this is an extremely challenging project. I mean, this is a major renovation of an existing historic building and a lot of systems work. So this is going to be, you know, difficult, tedious, time-consuming, uh, and uh, tricky in many ways to get it right. So uh, I think a uh, very uh, careful development of the design is essential in that regard. Uh, and certainly our, our review uh, is an important part of the process, but I think that uh, you know the, the design team and the, ultimately the construction team uh, and the Federal Reserve Board have their hands full uh, taking this on. It's, it's, it's pretty massive and it ranges from the treatment of historic components of the buildings all the way down to uh, developing, you know, underground spaces that are going to be covered by roads and and plantings and so on. Uh, all um, difficult stuff to do right. So um, good luck with that. Um, the um, I also would say that you know when it comes to some of the decision making along the way, uh, you know, like the decisions about parking and. Uh, you know, the response to some of the comments on the design and to the historic preservation concerns. Uh, I, I do feel like the, uh, uh, the the FRB has been making uh, very good decisions uh, and have been uh, understanding of the, the, the concerns of the many stakeholders who have spoken uh, to the development of this project. Um, and just close by saying that, uh, well, not close, but come close to close by closing by saying uh, that um, FRB, um, Jeff Fultz and Skip McGinley and others uh, have been uh, very good uh, partners in this. They've done a lot of outreach um, to the National Park Service from the earliest stages. I mean, I don't even remember when we first met on this, but it was many years ago. And I think that every move, um, the staff of the FRB has been working very hard to make sure that the concerns that we have are addressed and you know our stake in this is it, it may be bigger than other agencies in the immediate vicinity but it is uh, it's still um, you know relatively small compared with some other projects that were involved in so I do appreciate that attention to our concerns and I certainly know that's been uh, a, con a constant throughout the project in their management of it. So uh, kudos to the to the uh, uh, staff at uh, FRB. Um, and I just with regard to the staff report. Um, so I agree with all of the uh, all the recommendations and in particular would uh, note my appreciation for the comment about uh, antennas uh, and the fact that if there are ever going to be any antennas on top of this that they uh, they be appropriately masked. Um, because this is a building that you can see from great distances because or they are buildings plural that can be seen from great distances um, because of the, the land surrounding them and the, the broad avenues and so on. So 
uh, it's it's really important that uh, the rooftop not be scarred by um, the kind of junk that we often see on top of uh, buildings in Washington. So um, that's it for my comments. Thank you very much. I think this is a great project and uh, uh, look forward to seeing it finished and you know whatever how many ever years out that is. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner May. Uh, that that's back to me then. Uh, I want to just uh, express uh, some uh, gratitude for uh, an exciting and thoughtful renovation addition to these two incredible jewels uh, of Washington um, with very, very high visibil visibility. Um, I, I think that the care and uh, attention to uh, preserve and enhance these uh, these buildings and their historic surroundings is is very clear in the presentation at this preliminary level. I do have one or two little minor questions that I'll get to, uh, but uh, I'm embarrassed to ask one of them because it's such a small thing. But um, we'll get to that. Uh, some of the things that. Uh, I really appreciate, uh, like on the Eccles building, uh, the transition uh, with the vertical fins to connect the wings of the Eccles building. And I'm, uh, as I recall, there were uh, questions at one point about whether you would enclose one or both courtyards. I think that uh, doing both of those uh, seems to make a lot of sense. I'm glad programmatically. Uh, that made sense, and I think that the uh, thought and attention about the visibility of the skylights uh, from Constitution and uh, how those are sensitively being kind of placed at the proper elevation uh, is, is notable. I also like very much the transition uh, from the sloped roof of the existing building in the back uh, to the uh, addition with the sort of flat roof transition. Uh, those two kind of uh, are, are very uh, handsomely done in, in that transition. Um, the, I'm, I'm very happy about the parking uh, uh, work that everybody's done to get this to the one to five ratio and to uh, essentially have eliminated an entire floor of parking underneath uh, the uh, uh, FRB East building. Uh, that'll uh, not only help the environment, but also have uh, tremendous fiscal impacts and uh, reduced costs for additional parking that we won't need. Um, I do have just one little question that I'd like you all to uh, be in more depth about as we see this uh, for final, and that will be that is the knee walls in the front of the Eccles building. Um, the, it was described that the uh, the kind of perimeter walls will be replaced with knee walls, and I don't really know what that means. Um, and I don't know if anybody wants to comment on that now or when we when we see this back again. But I I see that as a very important character defining element of uh, this building from the street and um, I'm sure with the talent and skill of this team uh, you will you will consider that uh, very carefully as you kind of rebuild uh, the front lawns of, of both these buildings um, so with that I, I conclude my comments and I wonder uh, uh, open up for any further discussion uh, uh, from any of the commissioners. All right, um, then with that, is there a motion to approve the preliminary site and building plans for uh, these two Federal Reserve buildings? That's so moved. Uh, is Commissioner Argo? Commissioner May, second. Commissioner May, second. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. 
So, Ms. Coster, can you please confirm the motion in the second and then take the roll call, please? Certainly. Uh, commissioners, please say yes or no or abstain uh, as you answer, uh, Ms. Coster. Uh, the motion was made by Commissioner Argo and seconded by Commissioner May. Uh, and with that, Commissioner Trueblood? Yes. Commissioner McMahon? Yes. Commissioner May? Yes. Commissioner Argo? Yes. Commissioner White? Yes. Commissioner Gallus? Yes. Commissioner Wright? Yes. Commissioner Dixon? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Cash? Yes. Commissioner Spino? Abstain. Commissioner Ginsburg? Abstain. Thank you. Uh, there were two abstentions and the rest were A's, so the motion is approved. Well, thank you. Um, congratulations to the team uh, and the work uh, that has gone into this so far. We know that there's a lot more work to be done here, uh, but we uh, look forward to seeing you back again uh, for final approval. So with that, let's move to agenda item 7B, which is a request to approve comments on concept plans for the Pentagon Reservation Stormwater Engineering Design and security upgrades. Mr. Carlton Hart will make this presentation. Good afternoon, commissioners. I'm, uh, I wanna make sure everyone can hear me. Uh, we can hear you and see the screen. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. So uh, the Washington Headquarters Services has submitted uh, a project to improve stormwater management in addition to a security upgrade at the Pentagon in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, this project has been submitted for concept review. And uh, just uh, to, to go back a little bit, the concept uh, concept submissions um, under four concept submissions, staff uses the following to evaluate uh, these proposals, um, whether or not the, the concept is consistent with the comprehensive plan, federal elements and other NCPC policies and plans. Are there any particularly unique and or complex issues? Uh, and then finally, what uh, items need to be addressed prior to the next submission? So uh, here we have the Pentagon. I think you all are uh, aware of you know where where this is located in, in Arlington. Um, and I will be moving around the installation, describing uh, various proposals which which happen in different parts of the uh, of the installation. Um, and as a little bit of background, the Washington Headquarters Services (WHS) has submitted six projects as part of the Pentagon Reservation Stormwater Management Design and Security Upgrades. Five of these projects will reduce the Pentagon's site discharge of three pollutants in stormwater runoff as part of the Chesapeake Bay Total Maximum Daily Load, or TMDL, program. Uh, these are nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment. The Chesapeake Bay TMDL was established in 2010 by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency to improve the bay's uh, water quality and set a limit on the amount of pollutants that can enter into the bay. The Pentagon's Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System, or MS4 permit, requires WHS to comply with the Chesapeake Bay TMDL by reducing pollutant loads uh, for total, uh, total nitrogen, total phosphorus, and sediment in, in stormwater discharges. WHS must achieve 40% reduction by 2023 and 100% reduction by 2028, respectively. Oh, sorry. Uh, by 2028. The sixth project is a security and safety project, and I'll be describing all of these in the uh, upcoming slides. So uh, first is project one, which is located in the north parking lot uh, bounded by Route 110 to the west and uh, south and Boundary Channel Drive to the east. The parking lot is uh, currently contains 2100 uh, regular parking spaces and that is used by Pentagon employees. The uh, parking lot's existing surface cons uh, consists of asphalt and concrete, as you can kind of well tell. The parking lot's existing storm drain system consists of uh, great inlets located along the center and west ends of the east-west oriented parking rows and two main storm drain lines. The system discharges to Boundary Channel and the uh, Pentagon Lagoon, which then empties into the P Potomac River to the east. The drainage area for the existing storm drain system is approximately 9.7 uh, acres. 
Project one would install 14 bioretention areas at, at the inlets in the center of the parking lot. The installation would remove 224 regular parking spaces, leaving approximately 1900 remaining spaces. The installation would also remove about three quarters of an acre of impervious surface from the parking lot. And you can see the images of the um, of these uh, bioretention facilities uh, in the uh, in the, the images here on the screen. So uh, project two is located at the old east loading dock, which is situ situated north of the Pentagon Transit Center. The project area contains a, uh, a, a few um, facilities, the temporary K9 kennel building and a abandoned containment area consisting of a concrete pad surrounded by a retaining wall. The project area is also used for equipment storage. Um, under project two, which you see here, the proposal is on the right. Um, it would demolish the existing K9 kennel building as well as the existing abandoned containment area and replace it with managed turf. Um, they'd also install a new bioretention facility and replace three inlet existing inlets with storm drain manholes. These changes would remove approximately um, 0.2 acres of impervious surface. Below grade limits the extent of the bioretention area. So um, moving to project three, um, this is to install new tree boxes on the installation. These will be located in several parking lots to the northeast, east and south of the Pentagon. These are um, there are an existing 14 tree boxes on the uh, on the, the the site, the installation currently. Uh, project three would install an additional 25 tree boxes, and you can see the areas located here in these red um, kind of bubbles around the, uh, the installation. This is an example of the proposed tree box uh, inlet, which can be implemented through existing storm drain systems and will not interfere, interfere with uh, with parking. Open tree uh, pit, excuse me, open pit tree boxes with ground plantings were considered, but were dismissed due to increased maintenance needs and the potential for pedestrians trampling the, uh, the ground around them. Um, soil volume constraints limit the tree species that are appropriate for these conditions. Uh, existing tree boxes on the reservation are planted with serviceberry and bayberry, which come in both uh, shrub and, and small tree varieties. Additional plants being considered include honey locust and Washington hawthorn. Next, we move to project four, which is located at corridor five um, of the Pentagon, uh, the port corridor five parking lot on the west side of the Pentagon, uh, Route 27 uh, and the National 9-11 Pentagon Memorial are located to the west and south of the project site. The uh, parking lot currently contains 151 regular parking spaces and they're used by Pentagon senior officials. An old concrete helipad is located near the southern end of the parking lot uh, shown here. And in the image on the left, you can see where the 9-11, uh, the Pentagon's 9-11 Memorial is to the, uh, uh, to the project area, which is, um, it's actually just due south of it. Project four would install uh, three bioretention areas and regrade parking to ensure proper drainage. It would also install emergency call boxes as well as LED lighting. Um, it would also demolish the old helipad. Uh, there would be a slight increase in parking to 176 spaces. Next, we move to project five, which is located at the South Secure parking lot, which contains cars that have been screened at the North Rotary and Fern um, access control point, which is this area that's here. Um, both this lot and South parking are used by um, uh, uh, VIPs, well, used by employees that are entering into the Pentagon at corridors two and three. Uh, corridors two and three are actually shown here on the um, on the uh, slide. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. The South parking lot is bordered by North Rotary Road. Um, you see that located here. Uh, there is a sidewalk and continuous linear, uh, line, linear line of planters to the north. The south parking lot and these features are at a higher elevation than the south secure parking lot. So this is actually at a higher level than this is. Not a lot, uh, but it, there is a different, there's a, a topographic change. The planters sit atop of a retaining wall, which is visible from the south secure parking lot. You can kind of see this here, um, this dark, sorry, that dark area that's along here is actually the uh, retaining wall um, on the other side of the, the planters. Um, the South Secure parking lot's existing surface consists of asphalt and concrete. 
The parking lot's existing storm drain system consists of great inlets and uh, three main storm drain lines that discharge into the uh, into the, the Potomac River. Um, these areas are not currently uh, these areas do not currently contain stormwater management facilities to treat runoff. Project five would implement the following changes to the South Secure parking lot. Uh, it would install three bioretention areas, uh, install two tree boxes, reconfigure the parking between corridors two and, and three entrances for better traffic circulation and uh, restriping and redesigning the traffic flow. The bioretention areas would be planted with a diversity of hardy perennial natives that can receive um, occasional snow loads in winter without damage. All vegetation selected would be uh, salt tolerant and heat resilient, as well as tolerant to fluctuating soil moistures. Um, the staff supports the um, Washington Headquarters Services effort to incorporate stormwater bioretention facilities that would uh, further reduce total nitrogen, total phosphorus, and sediment discharges in, into the Potomac River, which are um, uh, in projects one through five. We also note that there would be an overall re parking reduction of 190 parking spaces on the Pentagon Reservation due to the installation of these stormwater best management practices. And finally, we re recommend that the applicant explore using understory and small trees instead of shrubs in the proposed tree boxes with Project 3 to help provide uh, shade. So that uh, gets us to Project 6, which is uh, a bit different from all the other projects in this group. Um, this is the security and safety project uh, that I noted earlier in the presentation. The sidewalk uh, serves multiple uses as a busy drop off and pick up point for uh, uh, Pentagon employees. Uh, and it's also a major pedestrian thoroughfare between the 9-11 Memorial, which again is over here on the west, um, to the Pentagon Transit Center where Metro is located, which is to the east. Carlton, we're not we're seeing not that, uh, what you're pointing to. You're not seeing this? Uh, give me a second. We're seeing Project 5 right now. I see Project 6 on my screen. OK. Yeah, I, I do yeah, as well. I'm the only one. Me too. Can you see it, can you see it now? Spread. I see 6. There it is. Okay. Thank you. OK. Um, so this is what I was saying that um, uh, Vice Chair Gallus, the um, National 9-11 Memorial is to the west and the the route that pedestrians that the public would walk would be here along here and then here to the uh, Pentagon Transit Center, which is basically where it's where Metro is. There are Metro buses which are here and then the Metro uh, escalator is here that goes down to the uh, to the platform. So um, this is the existing uh, North Rotary Road and adjacent sidewalk, which are shown on this slide. Um, these are both views looking towards the west. North Rotary Road, which is again um, on the, the left hand portion of the slide, uh, consists of three one way lanes separating the employee parking lot to the left and the South Secure parking, which is to the right. So this is regular parking. This is a uh, secure parking that's over here. The sidewalk is 14 feet wide next to a line of planters that are four feet wide, and that's shown in the image uh, on the far right. As you can see, there's this is a fairly stark pedestrian experience with no trees to provide uh, sh shade or much landscaping along this this 1200 foot long sidewalk. And again, this is 1200 feet. That's just the sidewalk. It doesn't include the um, the distance to Metro or the distance to the 9-11 um, Memorial. So it's a, it's a long walk. So this is what is being proposed, which includes um, uh, landscaping, trees, and a new cable rail system, along with bollards and a new eight uh, eight foot tall fence. And you know the, the commission generally supports replacing uh, temporary security measures with permanent infrastructure, particularly when those uh, when other components like trees and landscaping can be integrated. Um, while staff uh, while staff understands that the Pentagon needs a secure perimeter and that this is an improvement on the existing condition. Uh, this, this is still not a, a very inviting uh, walk between two security elements, being these um, where the bollards and, and, and cable rail system is, and then where the, the new uh, proposed fence would be. Staff is requesting additional information to help us understand a more complete picture for security on the southern side, given that there isn't an existing fence here now, and it's not clear why these two security elements are necessary in, in, so, in, in so close proximity to each other. 
So staff uh, recommends the applicant explain why this is necessary at this location by describing how it follows the uh, Pentagon Reservation Master Plan, describing the security perimeter and requesting information on why these um, two security measures could not be combined. And um, I hadn't shown it before, but this is the um, entire plan um, for the southern side of the Pentagon. Again, it includes sidewalks, um, a reduction in the width of the travel lanes for North Rotary Road, uh, a widening of the sidewalk that I showed you in the earlier slide, um, the introduction of a fence, a cable rail system with bollards, um, seating, trees and landscaping, and more space for passengers to enter and disembark from their vehicles. So from this area all the way down to here, cars can um, uh, pick up passengers as well as um, uh, have passengers disembark from their from the vehicles. Um, and then the seating areas you can see here um, in these yellow kind of areas here, here, and then at the end down here. Um, and then the entrances into corridors three and two are shown here as well. <coughs> Staffers, um, uh, we're, um, we understand that this is a, a, a through passage for visitors going to the 9-11 Memorial and for employees entering into the Pentagon. So it's kind of a dual role, role that it's playing. Staff is requesting a different, a different, excuse me, additional information to understand the constraints that guided this proposed design. Um, however, we also understand if existing constraints on the site prevent significant changes to the proposed design, we request that the Washington Headquarters Services further refine the design in a few ways. Um, and so the recommendations in these next few, these, these last slides are really to try to improve the pedestrian experience for the public and employees. Um, the first recommendation is to um, uh, add a planting strip or um, maybe it's a planting box with low growing shrubs or ground cover, um, which may begin to help to break down the monotony of the repetition of the fence itself. Um, and with this very long, uh, with, with this as is, is, is being a very long walk, uh, in addition, the introduction of pillars or posts along the fence could help to um, uh, help to reduce that monoton uh, monotony and, and repetition of the design as well. Staff would also like to make a few recommendations at the uh, the gates of corridors two and three to improve the experience for our employees. Um, and the first would be to possibly widen the gates um, to reduce the overall length of the fence along the stretch of sidewalk and to make them more welcoming. Um, the the next recommendation is to reduce the scale and large of the large stone clad bollards and really the ones that we're talking about are the ones that are shown here, um, which are at the uh, the entrance. They were really to try to demarcate where the entrance was as a visual thing, um, and you know possibly this could be uh, the the WHS could could possibly use the reduce the number of uh, of the pillars that are here or um, uh, using maybe a different paving to indicate the entrances. Uh, the last two recommendations um, are really um, uh, for improving the pedestrian experience along this, um, this stretch to add additional landscaping, um, uh, possibly trees in the proposed planting areas, which would be provided, um, which would help to provide additional shade for this very long uh, stretch. And the trees in this um, in the image that we've provide we've been provided seem a, a bit far apart, and so we were trying to find ways of adding some more shade for the uh, for pedestrians. And then finally, staff would suggest uh, WHS possibly add other pedestrian friendly elements such as public art to uh, help enhance this area. Um, again, this is a 1,200 foot long stretch, which um, you could you might be able to make a, a better experience if it was. Uh, if, if it did include some public art along the uh, along the way as some visual interest. Um, and with that, um, the recommendation is shown here in the slide. Um, and in the, in the interest of time, I will not be repeating all of this. Um, and you can find them in the uh, executive director's report that was distributed um, to you uh, last week. Um, and uh, that would um, conclude my presentation. We do have representatives from the Department of Defense joining us. Uh, from the uh, Washington Headquarters Services, as well as the Pentagon Force Protection Agency to help answer your questions. And um, I think uh, uh, Commission, Commissioner uh, McMahon may want to say uh, have a few words as well. Um, so that ends my presentation and uh, I'm here to answer any questions.
Thank you. And Commissioner McMahon, would you like to add to this presentation? Uh, Chair Gallus, thank you. Uh, well, just a couple of quick comments before we get into the discussion. I do have my staff and our designer of record available to answer questions, including that one of our security representatives. But uh, appreciate the opportunity to bring this project forward to see it presented to the board. And I, I think what you see in this project starting off with is very obviously, while it's required, you see a very strong commitment on the part of the Department of Defense to meet our obligations under the Chesapeake Bay Initiative um, resulting from this. Just to decide that we didn't take a look at buying offsets somewhere else, we've taken a look at our own property and how to reduce our impact coming across the property. And I'm very proud of the work the team has done. So thank you for that recognition. The second thing I want to talk about very quickly is the security aspects and a couple other comments. Um, first, uh, just we talk about we're doing two things with this Project 6, I think, that we're looking about. One is uh, completing the work described in uh, both our 2005 and 2015 master plans for the Pentagon to complete the com um, perimeter security for the building. And that for, along this section of the Pentagon perimeter consists of the anti-climb fencing and gates across quarter two and three entrances so that we can restrict the flow of the pedestrians onto the reservation from that direction um, better than we can today. It's a problem today. Um, we have people come in who get close to the building uh, without appropriate access or authorization um, to challenge for our uh, security force. This will help us um, complete that, that project and move forward. And that was actually in the master plan. The second piece and why it's separate and why I don't necessarily know we can combine the two as we took a look at options was the lessons we have all learned, and I think we've been at a lot of the same conferences, planning sessions, and, and guidance, uh, both for folks like us and for you know many facilities within the, the national capital region, is protecting pedestrian traffic ways, especially as, as Carlton has suggested, that we travel past uh, pedestrian passageways from vehicle-borne attack. Okay, um, We're not necessarily worried about bomb protection, we're worried about the individual in a car, a truck, a panel truck, um, deciding that a nice thing to do might be um, to travel across a crowd of people, whether it's depending on employees waiting to catch um, rides home because we have two slug lines um, on that row on North Rotary today, or the large number when we get back out of COVID-19 of visitors to the Pentagon Memorial, many of which transit there from the Metro Rentals facility. So as we take a look at our risk analysis and how we prevent those risks led us to that decision, not in our master plan, it wasn't a problem in 2015, to provide protection for those pedestrians um, um, uh, while they're on the reservation. Uh, I think the, the work the team has done is uh, very reflective of the things we try and do um, as a commission. Uh, we've seen the comments from the, the staff and we look forward after questions here um, and uh, working those comments and those suggestions to be able to respond to them as we continue on to develop our final designs. So again, thanks for the opportunity. I think this is a good project I just wanted to address especially the security questions before we get into uh, the rest of the commissioner's comments. Over. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, are there any questions uh, for uh, uh, Mr. Hart or Commissioner McMahon before we uh, go into deliberations? <clears throat> I do have one question, if I may, Mr. Hart. Could you put up uh, slide 19, please? Uh, just a clarification question. Um, we, uh, we'll get into the, the bigger one through six, but while we have project six, I mean, uh, uh, fresh in our minds. Yeah, that's good. Um, so I'm looking at the light green um, coloring uh, inside the fence, if you will. Um, and wondering what that might be intended. Uh, is that some sort of a uh, managed turf? Uh, what what are we visioning there, and how big, how wide would that be? Because my my uh, graphic doesn't have a dimension on that. Yeah, I I, I appreciate that the the question. Um, it's actually uh, if we could go back to slide twelve. I think that that's um, that'll show that. So the area that you're seeing is the there's a bioretention area 
that's that's shown that's right adjacent to the uh, where this walkway is. And I, I'm sorry, I'm having I, I don't think I can point to it, but it's the green area that says bio retention area one, area two, and area three. Those are the areas that that you're looking at. And so this is um, the where that fence is located on the uh, in the image in the upper right. That's the the that's mm -hmm. the that's where that proposed fence would be. And so this is right adjacent to the um, to a. I guess a, uh, a a low wall, and then um, a the the fence would be on top of that um, where that you know there's a I guess a grade change. Um, so and that's you're, the you're bioretention. At, yeah, it would be right. along. So that's there. a bioretention bioretention area that's inside the uh, the parking lot side, and it's sort of a, a, a green. Do we is that like a four foot area or something? What do we do we know? Um, I, I, I'm not exactly sure the in, entire dimension. I know that the uh, 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 WHS is here. I don't know if Brian, you want to answer that, or maybe um, uh, Alan Hardwood. This is uh, 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 um, Yeah, it, it's it's roughly 15 feet in width. And if you could just introduce okay. yourself again, I'm sorry, it's a little bit yeah. Uh, hard to hear. Yeah, this is AJ Zimmerman uh, from AECOM, and that bioretention area is roughly 15 feet in width. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, are there any other questions before we uh, open up for commission discussion? Um, I do have a question. This is Commissioner White, and I apologize if I missed this in the presentation or materials, but was there ever any consideration of permeable paving in any of the lots or along the, the edges of the sidewalk? I um, I think it's probably better to have the, uh, the WHS uh, respond to, to this question. And it looks like Mr. Mamawal, <laughs> Martin, you, you can you can answer, chime in. Yes, Madam Commissioner, I'm Martin Mamawal with WHS Engineering uh, Architecture. Uh, division. Yes, at the very beginning, in um, uh, one, some of our projects, we uh, were looking at doing permeable pavers. However, we found out uh, with the soil conditions, uh, with the high clay content uh, and in some, um, and relatively high uh, groundwater table, um, uh, we it made it very unfeasible. Uh, we have to uh, excavate. Uh, most of the existing soil um, and put in a, a significant under drainage uh, as well as membranes. We're actually having to do that with these bioretention basins, um, but we did uh, initially look at that. Uh, and we found out it wouldn't work with the site conditions. Over, ma'am. So what, was it just cost prohibitive or, or it wouldn't have achieved the goal of, of using them? I have to call on um, Brian King for the technical question was when we looked at the uh, pollutant removals, um, the bioretention basins, you had far greater uh, pollutant removals um, than the, uh, the pavers would. Uh, and then the other uh, problem we're running into, it, uh, have to, it was going to be very disruptive. We'd have to tear up um, all the parking lots. Uh, like I said, we'd have to excavate I believe um, we needed at least four feet uh, media um, and then another two feet below that. So a total of six feet uh, all across the parking lots would have to be excavated in, in order to get sufficient uh, drainage media and the under drainage system. But I think the primary driver is the bioretention basins uh, with the plantings are uh, more efficient and effective at the uh, uh, three pollutant reductions. Uh, Brian, um, if I missed anything, please add up. Yes, uh, Brian King with WHS Environmental Office. Uh, efficiency is a key here. Dollars spent per pounds of pollutant removed. It would have been an extremely expensive endeavor to go permeable pavers and do it right, and uh, and and concern with long term maintenance and keeping it and keeping those things in shape as well. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? All right, well, let's open it up to the commission for discussion. Uh, we're gonna go in a round robin format and uh, 
Today we'll start with Commissioner McMahon and, and then we'll go left to right uh, from there according to our normal seating order. Commissioner McMahon. Well, thanks for the opportunity to speak earlier. I've got nothing else to add at this time. All right, thank you. Uh, Commissioner May. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I completely agree with the um, the staff report and the concerns about Project 6 uh, with regard to security um, and and how that whole area could be changed to make it more uh, visitor friendly, uh, pedestrian friendly. Uh, and I do think that that can be achieved and uh, while still achieving the Pentagon security requirements. Um, I'm, I'm very concerned anytime we start talking about protecting pedestrians on sidewalks. Um, and I know it's a concern and we do want people to be safe, uh, but there are so many sidewalks in Washington that have so many people on them. And I'm afraid of where this could lead us. Um, and in, you know, there are a number of areas in particular that the Park Service um, you know, is concerned about in terms of that kind of protection uh, and how we can achieve it and still have uh, a good uh, visual experience for visitors and residents. Um, you know, we run the risk of uh, becoming a barricaded city if we go too far. Uh, so I think a very careful look at where it's truly needed uh, would make sense if there are going to be a lot of people queuing up in a spot and you can, you know, have some selective protection there. Um, I think that would work um, a lot better than having uh, this done more broadly. I also, you know, believe very strongly, you know, and this shows up in the images in the presentation where we see the, uh, you know, the, the array of bollards and the very large uh, concrete or rather uh, stone clad bollards. Uh, I mean, they're just so massive and so uh, forbidding. I, I just, I think that there has to be a better solution than that. Fortunately, uh, I think thanks to uh, Chairman Gallus pointing out the bioretention area, I think you have a built in solution. And I think all you have to do, and you know, maybe you looked at this, but all you have to do is flip the bioretention area to the other side of the fence and to the other side of the sidewalk. I mean, you can have sections. So in other words, the bioretention can be the, the vehicular barrier that would keep people away from pedestrians on the sidewalk. And then you can have sections where you cross over the bioretention uh, to get to the, the pickup points. Um, I mean, I, I think it's it, it, it suddenly became obvious after uh, uh, Chairman Gallus's comments that you could you could actually just swap those things around. I mean, I think there's a lot of other work that would have to be done to make that truly work. But you have a, a huge advantage by uh, putting in these very large um, uh, and and I mean, not just long, but wide. I mean, 15 feet wide. Wow. I mean, that would be um, a good way to stop uh, an ordinary vehicle from riding down the uh, the sidewalk. So, if you could have that on the on the side where you're trying to protect the pedestrians and then put the fence behind that, I think it would make it a much better experience. So, I hope you will look at that. Uh, and if that doesn't work for some reason look at other solutions. Uh, I think the staff report gives uh, good guidance on what to look at. And uh, so I look forward to seeing um, some new ideas on this uh, next time around. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner May. Uh, Commissioner Argo. Hi, um, I have. I think that Commissioner May has covered everything that I would have said uh, in terms of the, except I didn't have that idea of, <laughs> of using the, bio, the bioretention unit and putting it, you know, and essentially relocated it. I think that's a, I think that's an excellent suggestion. But other than that, I'd just like to um, I'd just like to to echo his comments. I think that, you know, the the last thing I would say is that it really is demonstrative when you look at that last, you know, that last slide where it's, you know, you've got fences, you've got bollards, you've got um, 
almost like this is a bad term, an explosion of uh, security measures. Um, I, that's just, it looks like, a, I don't know, it looks like a fortress. So um, again, uh, I'll echo, I'll echo Peter's comments um, and let the other commissioners comments at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Argo. Uh, Commissioner White. Uh, thank you. Um, I want to thank Commissioner McMahon for uh, giving us the background and and an understanding of the challenging aspects of this work and um, the need for security when we're talking about the Pentagon. It's a it's a tough balance, and um, I really appreciate that. I also appreciate the response from the design team about looking at items like permeable pavers and you know just looking at this and seeing the sea of parking lots it's not an easy thing to to solve for um, but i appreciate the willingness to look at all of these things in a fresh way and um, with respect to commissioner may's suggestion for flipping the the um, green space um, I would be interested to hear if that's possible, if it's something that is needed to be where it is to drain the parking lots, but um, anything we can do to make that pedestrian experience a little more uh, humane um, would be appreciated. But I, I do support the staff comments on this project and again, appreciate the, the sensitivity in trying to take this on and achieve so many different goals at the same time. So um, thank you for the work on this. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go to Commissioner Wright now. Um, <clears throat> I have many of the same comments. I think the staff report nailed it, which is pretty admirable because I, Wow, it, this is a lot um, to look at. Um, I I would only uh, I would also go to that last that that offending slide, and say and refer you to the Department of Commerce. We faced something very similar in terms of having fifteen hundred feet of relentless perimeter security. Um, I don't. It doesn't look like <clears throat> you may have room on the sidewalk to think about some some. Um, seat walls or something like that and perhaps you don't want people hanging out there but if it's an employee entrance i would urge you to consider it and um as we so often say simplify 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 there's just a lot of of junk out there it i mean it's not junk i know it all does something important but there's got to be a simpler way to do it um i uh, it, um with <clears throat> And if there isn't a simpler way to do it, if the, if you can't reduce the number of components, try to unify the design language because right now it just feels a little, um, oh, I don't know. It's just a little much of a muchness. <laughs> All right, uh, well, thank you. I'm sure that's a, that's a quotable quote. A little much of a muchness. We'll remember that one. Um, Commissioner Dixon, any comments? Commissioner Dixon? Okay, let's uh, let's let's move on. I think Commissioner Cash had to step away if I if I'm correct. Uh, not correct. Um, I'm with you now. So let's go. Commissioner okay, Dixon. Commissioner. Thank you. Hello. Hi. I just think uh, the staff did a great job. It's really uh, complex. I always like to see the ballots and other things used in a, as in a, at a as service rather than walls. So if there are ways you can make sense to put some kind of a accommodation for one side or the other on the fence or wall, it'd be useful, I think. But I think great job and uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, Commissioner Cash has had to step away, so we'll go to Commissioner Spino. Uh, no comments at this time. Thank you for your work on this. All right, uh, thank you. Commissioner Ginsburg. 
Um, also, no comments at this time. Thank you. Okay, and that uh, let's go back now around the table to Commissioner Trueblood. I just um, I agree with what my fellow commissioners said, and I really have no uh, no more value to add other than what they shared. All right, thank you. Um, so um, that that's back to me, uh, and I just want to do a few uh, overarching comments. First of all, I, I'd like to just mention, you know, my father spent the last 20 years of his career at the Pentagon, and uh, after he retired uh, uh, is when uh, the plane attack occurred, and, and it was in the wing that he formerly worked in before retiring. So I do realize and, and place high importance in the security of the Pentagon, and I think the work that you all are doing is very, very important here. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, projects one through five and the dramatic change that this is going to make in some of these sea of parking lots and, uh, and uh, paved areas that surround the Pentagon. And uh, I think that the uh, enhancements to the environment will be palpable. So thank you for that. Um, I, I think that what was interesting to me about the, the last uh, rendering uh, of, of Project 6 um, is the kind of uh, reference to uh, will greatly improve the pedestrian experience. And I, I, I know that we're trying to do many things here. It's like a coming together of, of a lot of challenges with security and pedestrian experience and stormwater and all of these aspects uh, happening. But I think we're up to this challenge uh, to do, do exactly what the goal is, is to improve the pedestrian experience. And we think uh, the Pentagon and the design team can do better on this one. Um, the, um, I, I think that there are a couple of options. You know, if we could go to that rendering, I, I'd appreciate it. Um, what, as it, as it comes up, uh, what I'm what I'm wondering about, uh, you know, is to what degree today we don't have um, uh, this need for the kind of cable system and secure uh, sidewalks along this. So, you know, if, if the threat assessment says you need it, I, I believe it. Uh, you have a very wide sidewalk there. I think it's going to come down to nine foot seven when all said and done. And I'm wondering if uh, there could be, uh, you know, either Commissioner May's idea, which is a wonderful idea, or uh, something as simple as a hedgerow that would sort of be in front of the fence. A hedgerow along in this image in front of that fence would make a dramatic difference in the way a pedestrian might experience it. And, uh, you know, uh, and the hedgerow doesn't have to be to the top of the fence. It doesn't even have to be uh, to eye level. But I think it could um, provide a, a kind of green buffer, a softening of this in a way that would make a dramatic difference uh, in this. So um, let me see if I had any other comments. I, I think that um, we really want you to go back and, and work on this. Uh, there's a lot of talent on this team that can make something, you know, dramatically better about this. So, uh, so that we can all uh, say at the end that it did greatly improve the pedestrian experience. So thank you very much. Um, are there uh, any other comments or questions uh, having gone around uh, the table that anyone would like to add at this time? All right, so is there a motion to approve 
Uh, Mr. Chairman? The comments? Mr. Chairman? Oh, oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, Go right I, ahead. I, thought, um, um, I think uh, Commissioner Argo suggested we might want to hear from the applicant about whether the idea of flipping the bioretention area um, might be feasible. Um, I'd be interested in hearing that answer if they have one. And of course, if they don't, that's fine. We can just hear that later. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone like to chime in here? Um, this is Mark Mamal with WHS. Uh, I noticed, uh, all right, uh, Mr. McMahon had raised his hand, but uh, in regards to the feasibility, uh, we will uh, look at that. Um, the, the problem uh, that we have uh, that was mentioned, we've got a three to four foot grade change. Um, and so with uh, the bioretention basins, uh, the reason why they're at the lower grade, that's where the storm drains from the parking lot that are to the left on, on that the graphic. Uh, the storm drains are coming in below the road, road bed right at the top of the bioretention basin. And we're just barely getting uh, the required four foot of treatment media uh, plus 12 inches above that. Um, and, and then the sidewalk is another three or four feet above that. Uh, we It would be, um, uh, difficult to try and get the drainage flow um, over to a bioretention basin built at that grade. If I may, so the bioretention has to be at the level of the the parking lot on the other side of the fence is what you're saying. Yes, sir. We're working with the existing storm drainage and the slopes and the grades. Right. So it, it has to be lower. I mean, it seems to me that that actually helps you in some way um, because you could take that entire section of sidewalk and fence and just move it to the other side of the bioretention. So you wind up with that lowered bioretention, which gives you even more of a barrier. I mean, maybe it winds up looking bad and, and too forbidding in itself and looks too much like a moat, but um, I think it's, there are ways to work with the grade that that could help you there and could make actually for a very interesting walking experience through that area. Thank you. This, this is uh, Paul McMahon um, uh, and Chairman Gallus. Certainly will take the suggestion back from Mr. May. It's good to have these conversations. I appreciate them. He just mentioned a moat. Perhaps we could stock the moat with alligators. That would help us with our, our force protection. <laughs> I suspect we'll consider that. I don't know what that'll mean in the winter time, but with uh, climate change, it may not matter so much. But with you know, my initial thought is I, I see issues, but until we have our, our good engineers and uh, and designers take a look at what that looks like and what it means, it'd be, it'd be hard to uh, to say yes or no. So we'll take that back and consider it. What I also want to note before we, we wrap up here is that what didn't reflect in Carlton's great presentation is some of the work since he prepared his brief, but he's been doing with our team to start softening up some of those architectural elements that have come up in discussion. So I think progress is already being made and we'll continue to work on those as we uh, move forward, I presume after today, to, to uh, start making final designs. Over. Thank you. Thank you. Anything more, Commissioner May? Uh, no, I will say that, you know, I uh, uh, we once had a member of Congress suggest we build a moat at a, one of our sites. Um, it was interesting. <laughs> okay. Well, um, with that, I'm going to ask if there's a motion to approve the comments on the concept plans uh, for these improvements at the Pentagon. Uh, please make sure to state your name when you make the motion. Uh, this is Commissioner White. I move to approve. Okay. Is there a second? Uh, Commissioner May, I'll second the motion. Thank you. So, Ms. K Ms. Coster, can you please confirm the motion and the second, and then take the roll call? Certainly. Uh, the motion was made by Commissioner White, seconded by Commissioner May, and now I will uh, start with uh, Commissioner Trueblood. Yes. Uh, Commissioner McMahon? Yes. Commissioner May? Yes. Commissioner Argo? Yes. 
Commissioner White. Yes. Commissioner Gallus. Yes. Yeah. Commissioner Wright. Yes. Commissioner Dixon. Yes. I believe Commissioner Cash is, as you said, not here. So Commissioner Spino. Abstain. Commissioner Ginsburg. Also abstain. Okay. Uh, so that is uh, two abstentions and the rest of the attending commissioners in approval. All right, thank you. The motion is approved. Thank you. We look forward to the next round of uh, design uh, evolution on, on this. Thank you very much. Okay, let's now move to uh, agenda item 8A, which is our last agenda item. It's a staff information presentation on the I-495 and I-270 managed lane study. Mr. Weil, I know you've been working a lot and a long time on this, and so we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, can I get confirmation that you all can see the screen? Yes, we can see it and we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Vice Chairman Gallus and members of the Commission. Today I am here to brief the Commission on the status of the I-495-270 managed lane study and to seek Commission concurrence on our proposed draft environmental impact uh, statement comments, uh, which we plan to send to the State Highway Administration prior to the conclusion of the study's public comment period, which ends on November 9th. As a reminder, there are several federal interests related to the study, with the most significant interest being SHA's proposed use of Cap or Crampton land for capital beltway widening across the Rock Creek, Sligo Creek, Cabin John, and Northwest Branch Stream Valley Parks. Per the Cap or Crampton Act, NCPC must review and approve all park development in accordance with an agreement with the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, and use of this land is only intended for park related purposes such as trail access, stormwater management and recreational amenities. NCPC's authority requires our commission to protect this land and to only allow non-park uses if no feasible alternative exists. In addition to the Capra Crampton property, Beltway expansion may also require land from several, several federal properties near the Beltway, including NSA Bethesda, the Beltsville Agricultural Research Center, Joint Base Andrews, and multiple nas National Park Service properties. The extent of the project impacts are still relatively uh, conceptual at this point, and any physical changes to federal property would require NCPC review under the National Capital Planning Act in an advisory capacity. Finally, the Commission also has a broader interest in improving the overall transportation network for the National Capital Region with better multimodal connectivity adding transit, pedestrian, and bicycle facilities, and encouraging more efficient travel behavior by federal employees. This is the third information presentation of the Commission on the Managed Lane Study, with the first presentation made by State Highway Administration staff last July 2019, and a second presentation by SHA in November 2019. As shown on the timeline, SHA has released a draft environmental impact statement for public review and comment. The study currently evaluates a total of six build alternatives, all designed to accommodate future travel along the Maryland I-495 Beltway and southern segment of I-270. After conclusion of the public comment period, SHA will select a preferred alternative uh, early next year and then release a final EIS and record of decision in the fall of 2021. The managed lane study area is shown here in red on the left-hand side of the slide. And SHA and FHWA are currently undertaking pre-NEPA activities for a companion study known as the I-270 North study with a study area that extends along I-270 uh, between Gaithersburg and I-70 in Frederick, Maryland, and this area is shown in blue. SHA's current planned construction phasing is depicted on the right with phase one highlighted in yellow, phase two, which is adjacent to the Capra Crampton Parks, highlighted in orange, and a third phase in green. 
Current estimates related to the timing of the project's later phasing are approximately five years from now in 2026 for phase two and 10 years from now in 2030 for the start of phase three construction. So here are the comments from our last uh, comment letter from uh, to the SHA. And over the next few slides, I will go through each of our previous comments. I will summarize how SHA responds to the comments through the draft DIS. And then I will describe our proposed follow up comments, which we plan to document in a staff letter to SHA after today's meeting. Our first comment reflects extension, extensive discussion by the Commission during SHA's last information presentation, urging the state to include the Maryland 200 as a full build EIS study option. And this would be both in the spirit of NEPA and to prioritize Capra Crampton Park preservation over widening the Bellway to facilitate auto travel in the region. We note that the draft EIS reflects a modeling analysis of the Maryland 200 alternative. However, SHA has not developed the alternative any further as a full build study option since last fall. Yet NCPC staff continue to see the benefit of future travel diversion to the ICC, both as a viable solution for accommodating future travel and to help our commission understand the, the trade-offs between park preservation and development scenarios. Here is the Maryland 200 alternative, which would divert some future travel to the intercounty connector rather than using the northern beltway between I-95 and I-270. And while the diversion would increase the distance for some travelers, travel demand between Baltimore and I-95 could be conveniently diverted, and NCPC staff believes that the EIS technical report shows sufficient benefit from the Maryland 200 alternative to warrant additional development and assessment by the state as a full build option. So here are the proposed comments for commission consideration. Uh, first, we note the Maryland 200's alternatives notable performance compared to the other build uh, alternatives. We note the additional benefit of the alternative, both in accommodating some future travel demand and to help our understanding between park preservation and development trade-offs. And finally, we state our belief that adding the Maryland alternative as a build option is supported by the one federal uh, decision executive order, which allows analysis beyond what is necessary for the needs of the lead federal agency. Regarding our second comment, we communicated this to SHA after their decision to eliminate the only lesser two uh, lane build option known as alternative five from further development and assessment through the managed lane study. Staff noted the potential adverse result of retaining only alternatives that would have, uh, have the same impact area across the Capper Crampton Park, thereby creating a potential situation where NCPC would not be able to rely on the final EIS and record of decision to satisfy our own NEPA responsibility for potential project submissions. Since then, SHA has added a new alternative known as Alternative 9M, which consists of a two lane beltway expansion adjacent to Capper Crampton Parkland and a more extensive four lane widening around the rest of the Maryland Beltway study area. The 9M alternative does meet the purpose uh, and need as determined by the State Highway Administration and NCPC staff view uh, Alternative 9M as a compromise solution that broadens the study in response to our previous comments. We note that Alternative 9M is limited in its capacity to reduce park impacts, however, with a modest 13% reduction or 1.5 acre decrease in total impact area, and we reflect this in our first comment to SHA. Our second proposed draft comment notes that the addition of 9M would broaden the range of alternatives, which in turn would help NCPC's ability to use the final EIS and ROD to satisfy our Commission's NEPA responsibility. And finally, we re reiterate our continued support for further development and study of the Maryland 200 alternative as a viable build option, both for avoiding Capra Crampton Parkland while still achieving some of the state's transportation goals and objectives through the study. Here was our third comment that it would be difficult to understand the trade offs between Parkland development and preservation without more detailed cost and benefit information. 
We note that while the draft EIS does show general economic regional benefits and construction costs associated with each alternative, uh, although this information remains substantively unchanged since our last information presentation. In response to previous NCPC comments, however, SHA has indicated that they would include more detailed cost benefit information associated with their preferred alternative. While this information is useful, more importantly, uh, NCPC staff feel that SHA should assess all of the alternatives in a fair, consistent and equal manner with the same level of detail and development afforded to each of the alternatives. And this would include the Maryland 200 ICC alternative as well. We also believe that the final EIS should uh, effect effectively communicate the benefits of Capper Crampton Park preservation, not only for its important environmental services, but also as a valuable recreational amenity and as an influencer of development patterns in suburban Maryland over the past 90 years. And we reflect these points in the proposed draft comment on the bottom of the slide. Our fourth comment to SHA advocated for broadening the scope of the study to accommodate future regional mobility rather than studying potential solutions that only consider managed lanes. We note that the purpose and need has not changed since November 2018 and the nature of the study remains focused on future beltway managed lane expansion. However, SHA describes multiple potential profits that would improve multimodal travel through measures such as discounted or no fee managed lane use by high occupancy vehicles and new direct access ramps to transit hubs near the Beltway and I-270. The draft EIS includes a moderate amount of information related to park avoidance and minimization efforts with fewer details on potential mitigation. However, we understand that specific mitigation is currently under development and that the final EIS and record of decision will ultimately include this information. In response, as shown uh, in the slide, we note our need for more specific transit service, pedestrian and bicycle improvement mitigation at the time of potential future project submissions to NCPC. And we further note that NCPC would not issue a record of decision until we receive a formal project application from the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. Our fifth and final comment recommended that SHA adequately reflect the growing use of automated vehicle travel in its traffic model. The draft EIS does acknowledge AV technology as an important consideration. However, the State Highway Administration indicates that they will continue to use traditional forecasting methods uh, since it's still too early to understand how wider spread automated vehicle use will truly affect area mobility and travel in the region. In addition, growth in addition to the growth of automated vehicle travel, two other ongoing events that appear to be contributing to planning uncertainty associated with this with the study. Number one, recent events with the purple line which may cause significant delays to the opening of this regionally significant east-west transit facility across suburban Maryland. And number two, changes in travel behavior from the ongoing pandemic. And in light of these factors, NCPC staff remain unclear how SHA will adapt the study and its future planning efforts for managed lanes to reflect this planning uncertainty, which has increased since their last information presentation. And the proposed draft comments on the bottom of the slide are intended to speak to these points. In light of our ongoing coordination with the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, here are some relevant park and planning staff comments from their presentation to their commission this past July. First, their staff continue to concur with our belief that the state should add the Maryland 200 ICC alternative as a full build study option. And the remaining comments communicate their need for more detailed impact and mitigation information, the potential pitfalls of continuing to minimize the project's limit of disturbance, which may result in less flexibility in adapting the most effective mitigation measures for park resources, and their assessment of pro the project's current stormwater management plans as inadequate. Here are some other process and future expectation related comments from park and planning staff. And we note their expectation that any potential project submissions to NCPC would need to include comprehensive information on avoidance techniques, impact minimization, 
restoration, mitigation, and parkland replacement as reflected in final study documents and P3 agreement. Park and planning staff are scheduled to present their final draft EIS comments to their commission on October 21st, which will then be sent to the State Highway Administration, and we note our continued support for their comments and recommendations at the bottom of the slide. So here are the next steps for us. As previously described, we are seeking commission concurrence on our proposed set of draft EIS comments, and we will convey these and any other additional comments heard from the commission at today's meeting in a staff comment letter to the State Highway Administration. Thank you, and that concludes my presentation, uh, and I am now available for any questions by the commission. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weil, for that comprehensive presentation. Um, and I guess before we begin the commission discussion, anybody have any specific questions of staff at this time? I have one question, Mr. Weil. It has to do with the um, uh, the comments you ended with from the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I'm, are we, are we to assume that our letter, uh, in response to the DIS will, um, uh, reference or, or embrace those, uh, Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission comments as well as part of our response? Uh, yes, that's correct. Uh, they have very detailed comments, uh, that relate to, uh, their feeling that the purpose and need is inadequate still uh, does not consider a broader approach to accommodating future travel in the region. Uh, they do still have concerns with the proposed uh, limits of disturbance across Capra Crampton Parkland and other parks uh, and a number of issues that I think uh, we we continue to support. So that was just a broad uh, comment that we continued our support of their review uh, and comment uh, and expertise in reviewing the project. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you may have said it, but uh, can you amplify just a little bit more about with alternative 9A, which is the one that was added uh, subsequent to our earlier comments? Um, uh, I think there was something like this would only really improve the impact on Capra Crampton land by around 13 percent. Is that correct? Uh, it would it would only result in a 13 percent total impact area reduction from the other four lane beltway widening scenarios. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Which equates to about one and a half acres. OK. Thank you. Over the whole uh, stretch of, of right the road total road. impact yeah. area. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, and in this letter, where we address, you know, alternative 9M, and also our interest in uh, them exploring the 200 alternative, uh, will we reference that statistic, if you will, as part of the? letter comment? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. All righty. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments from Mr. Weil uh, before we go through formal discussion? Mr. Chair. Like Commissioner White. Let's go with uh, Commissioner White and then Commissioner Trueblood. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I have a question as to the willingness of the applicant to do an amended uh, draft EIS because these are pretty significant issues and if they are saying that we're going to resolve them in the FEIS what opportunity does the public have to really understand what those are and have a meaningful analysis of their response so I know that's not an ordinary thing but it's certainly something within the realm of possibility and I think the the EIS process is um, particularly around big highway projects is problematic mm -hmm. when the answer is, well, we'll address that in the FEIS. Uh, I, unfortunately, I do not foresee them going back and adding the Maryland 200 alternative as a full build uh, option in the study. 
Uh, however, uh, that would be in an ideal situation for our commission uh, because it really focuses on our uh, preservation interests of the Capper Crampton parks. Uh, so we still felt that it would uh, be uh, be important to continue to request that. And that's also a, a position held by uh, staff from the Maryland National Capital uh, Park and Planning Commission as well. So uh, we our plan is to continue to go ahead and request uh, that information, um, you know, in the hopes that that they will uh, reconsider uh, looking at that as a full build option. Well, I think that's important um, to keep pushing on that point because the analysis should be done. So Correct. thank you. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner Trueblood. Thank you. Uh, I'll just second that point. Uh, I, I don't know how we can do our our job uh, without that. And I don't, it, it, this sort of feels like issues we see with parking and trees where we sort of get jammed into what uh, the proponent, the project sponsor wants. I think the difference here is there's a pretty clear federal law and a pretty, pretty clear mandate. So that was a comment and I apologize, uh, but I just had to say that. But I wanted to pick up on something and it's a, question and a comment, and it's something I emailed you about earlier, which is um, there's a historic African-American cemetery, Moses Hall Cemetery, um, and I was asking about whether it is part of Capra Crampton lands, and it seems like it's not, we don't know exactly, I, I think, is that fair, Mr. Royal? Uh, I, I was not able to find any reference in the documents, Okay. Um, but I will keep looking. So, but I, I guess my broader point uh, is that, and this is something I've heard from uh, M M Maryland National Park and Planning Commission, which it seems as if the kind of assessment of the lands, of the cultural lands, of the Section 106 uh, um, work is really not really far enough along to make some of these decisions in some ways, or, or, or to kind of be fully informed. Uh, it seems as if, if we don't even exactly know all of the lands that are, are implicated and all of the assets that are implicated, how are we able to make true assessments? Uh, and so uh, I just, I guess maybe that's, it's, it's a question I asked earlier, but it's a, I want to put it on the record. Um, and especially, you know, given a historic African-American cemetery, uh, I, I, I don't want that, that kind of asset to be lost. Um, even if, you know, maybe it isn't under our uh, official jurisdiction, um, but it is worth worth noting. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I, I, I know from talking extensively to park and planning staff that they would concur with you that uh, the, the state seems to be really be expediting this study under the one uh, federal decision process, uh, which is really geared towards cutting down NEPA studies from two to three years to about a year um, and uh, I, I think you know that's been their comments all along that that they're making decisions based on incomplete data and that includes data on cultural resources uh, and environmental justice related resources such as uh, uh, historic African-American cemeteries. And if they're doing you know they are the ones who are providing us some of our information right um, so I don't understand if they don't have that on the broader sense, how do we have it in the narrower sense? Uh, and I, I guess that's a way of saying I don't know. It's hard to even provide comments uh, until we uh, have some of that detail. Um, and it's concerning that uh, I think as Commissioner White mentioned uh, this idea that well maybe it'll be resolved in the FEIS. It reminded me a little bit of the Union Station uh, ongoing. I'll just call it challenges. Um, uh, it's fine. It's all fine and well to try and move expeditiously. It's another thing to literally pave over African American cemeteries and 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 the parkland that we are um, we are in charge of protecting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we staff definitely agrees with you, uh, and 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 we continue to work with Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission staff to push the state uh, into kind of you know, collecting more data, doing the good work that uh, should be done, um, you know, to, to provide this sort of information with which to make, uh, you know, these types of decisions uh, on. So uh, we absolutely agree with you and, and, and we're happy to add a comment uh, that, that really uh, articulates that point. 
Thank you. All right. Um, let's uh, open up to any uh, commission comment. Uh, while we're not voting on this item, uh, staff is seeking uh, our sentiments from the commission in order to uh, fully develop the comment letter that will be prepared and sent on this. Um, and so I wonder if uh, anyone else would like to comment at this time. We don't need to go. Uh, we I, maybe I'll just go round robin just to make sure. Let's start with Commissioner Wright. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, <clears throat> uh, oops, sorry. I have to flip my laptop open too because I don't have a monitor, uh, camera on my bigger monitor. Um, I am really glad that you're going after this 200 thing, and I'm really disappointed. But I expected that answer that you don't um, expect the state to undertake this the the full build look at the 200. Um, issue they were i mean i i i have found their response um unsatisfactory at every turn the 200 um even the dynamic signage where i mean i may have missed that sorry i'm really tired today um the uh did I, my recollection is that they that they sort of nix the dynamic just even experimenting as a trial with the dynamic signage um, is that true i i did see reference in the draft eis to trying to incorporate more strategic placement of dynamic signage to try to encourage uh, additional traffic uh, to use the icc um, so i did i did see that so so uh, and my i further re recollect that they suggested that icc would be at capacity by 2030 is is that the date i believe it was 2027 which i i'm not a traffic engineer but i i find i find this hard to believe and what what i find worse than that that it's hard to believe is that there seems to be a continuing unwillingness to explore the options and i mm -hmm. and i just wish they would be more forthcoming about what the reasons are because i don't mind somebody saying well we'll look into that and then coming back and saying well we looked into it and it really didn't cut the mustard i do mind being stiff armed and I feel like we have continued to same things. And I know you are. This is not a complaint. This is a this is support for the for the comments because I I just don't think we should let it go. Um, and I can't help but say this. I want I, I uh, there was a guy who I, one of the architects who commented on the Pentagon project about the the. Um, pervious pavers or whatever and and he slipped if you heard him and he said yeah you know we we we, we it's just cost prohibitive to do the right thing god that's one of the saddest phrases i've heard in government in a long time because if the federal government can't set the example by doing the right thing citing cost pro prohibition then how is it that we expect the private sector to follow suit? Mm -hmm. What a sad remark. And I think that's what's happening here. We're, we can only, again, think, we can't think beyond the end of our noses and recognize that, that, the, that what's happening is going to make the situation worse. The alternatives are gonna make things worse. And and so the the reluctance to is a nice way to put it. Resistance is more accurate to to exploring the other alternatives more fully is uh, disappointing. So go get them and don't give up. Right. No, uh, agreed. And and one of my comments speaks to our interpretation of the one federal uh, decision executive order, and that it does allow. Um, cooperating agencies to request additional analysis 
over and above what the what the co the lead agency feels that they need to satisfy their needs. So we we do have a comment saying that hey look we feel like we need you to you know analyze the Maryland 200 alternative as a full build option uh, and we feel that this is supported by the one federal um, decision executive order. So we will absolutely um, highlight that. And uh, and the state that the state planning agency agrees with you is is it's it's hard to believe that they they won't consider this. I, I maybe we'll be surprised. Anything can happen in 2020. Thank you. I hope so. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, in the interest of uh, trying to get Commissioner Ginsburg. Uh, her, any comments she has before she has to step away at 3.30. Let's jump to her and then we'll come back uh, to uh, Commissioner Dixon after that. I, I appreciate that, I, I really do. I, I don't have many comments except to say it's obvious how much hard work went into this and it was a pleasure to listen to the presentation. And um, I'm gonna listen to as many more comments as I can before I have to hop off, but thank you, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you. Let's go to Commissioner Dixon, please. Very complicated and I'm very interested in this. I just can't wait to see what, what they can come up with that can help deal with this as a big issue. All right, thank you, Commissioner Dixon. Uh, Commissioner Cash. I believe he has uh, oh. uh, left the meeting. Still Still stepped away. OK, thank yeah. you. Uh, Commissioner Spino. No comments. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, let's go back to Commissioner Trueblood. Thank you. And I realize my earlier question was a comment as much as it was a question, so my apologies. So I'll just say that comment again. Uh, but two others, uh, just number one, I, you know, I, I, I want to um, vociferously continue to support uh, what Commissioner Wright said about considering uh, uh, the 200 alternative. Uh, I just I, I don't I don't know how we can do our work without that uh, without that deep analysis. Uh, but I also want to support something that you all said uh, or that, that that was in the presentation, which is uh, really the changing dynamics of COVID, uh, the, the changing dynamics of uh, commuting and patterns of transportation have been significant uh, over the last six months, and our and a new, numerous studies show that they are like many of them. While we are bouncing back a little bit, many of them are likely to be similar moving forward. I think it would be uh, 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 how do I say it? I, I don't know how you could justify a project at this day and time that uses transportation assumptions of a year ago uh, or nine months ago. Uh, and so I don't know if that's a revision of the purpose and need, if that's a revision of the transportation model or how they will be taking that into account. But I don't know how we can look at it. Uh, and, and as I think there were some questions about the transportation modeling. Um, not that any of us are transportation modelers, but I do know it is different today than it was six months ago. Um, so I just think that I, I really want to underscore the comment that you provided and say that uh, you know I think we it would be very helpful to see how their modeling has changed because it's it, we, we based on, basing it on a model from a year ago we may as well base it on models from 20 years ago it just it, it's just so different so um, those are my primary comments thank you thank you and thank you Commissioner Trueblood and I'd like to just jump in real quick on adding something to your point. Uh, two items. One, you know, there was also uh, we're going to be commenting on the purple line and what's going on there as it's playing out uh, real time here and and how will that uh, moving forward or not moving forward uh, impact uh, in the same fashion uh, this kind of ability to predict traffic patterns. And then one more, I think that was also mentioned is the automated uh, vehicle technology, which continues to evolve at a rapid pace and will, as we all believe, dramatically change traffic patterns. So these kind of 
changing forces occurring at a time when we're looking at historical data um, makes it, you know, all the more challenging to want to sort of press ahead with this kind of an initiative uh, by using historical data, in my opinion. So anyway, thank you for bringing that up. Um, thank you. All right, let's go to Commissioner uh, McMahon. Please wait for the leader. Thank you. I have uh, no comments right now as I wait for another meeting to start, but I appreciate the presentation. You are now joining. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner May. Uh, I don't have anything to add I, except to say that we, uh, uh, the Department of the Interior will be sending its own comments on the, uh, uh, on the EIS uh, as uh, the lands that are, the parkland that is primarily being impacted or, uh, well, I, I don't know the exact quantity of lands, but um, uh, significant National Park Service land is affected and we will be sending our own uh, comments and concerns uh, uh, to Marilyn Day Highway. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Commissioner Argo? Uh, just to echo the um, uh, couple of comments that we've had, uh, I have read two articles in the last two days about um, what was already mentioned about the changing patterns in commuting, um, in particular commuting driving as a result of the pandemic. And even after the warning flags, you know, go down about the um, about COVID-19, the expectation that those patterns will continue um, and that there will be less commuter traffic um in major cities and on major arteries so just that to keep in mind which echoes some of the comments that we've heard earlier thank, thank you thank you very much commissioner Argo. Thank you. yes um and uh now commissioner white uh thank you i echo everyone's comments i particularly want to thank commissioner trueblood for raising the question about uh, impact on an African-American cemetery, and I would really love to hear back from staff what you find out about that. Mm -hmm. And it, it um, reminds me that I, I want to be very clear in my about my previous comments on the FEIS. The, it is a constant refrain from this department and many other transportation departments don't this. So I want to be really clear that I, I want to Ha ask them formally, would they be willing to do an amended draft EIS to answer the question? And our society is at a major inflection point, and the reminder that this could potentially impact an African American cemetery makes me reflect on the very long history of impacts on communities of color with all of our transportation projects, particularly um, big highway projects. Mm -hmm. So the the notion that people are not willing to take a fresh look at this, given the tumultuous change on our society from both COVID-19 and the previous comments about how this may change and is already changing our transportation patterns, I would argue that that was happening long before COVID-19. But this idea of um, impact on communities is very serious and one that should be taken seriously. And then my final point is I remember back to one of the presentations when we ask about coordination with other transportation entities and things like the dynamic signage that Commissioner Wright brought up. It's as though we're only um, looking at this project from the transportation planner's perspective in their own one singular view. And those days are behind us. We have to really look at this holistically and think about these multiple impacts. And it still is just really disappointing and frustrating to hear, oh, that's not going to work, but we're not going to do the work to prove up why we're saying that. And that's just not acceptable. So in terms of, of saving money, do the work now so that we may be saving lots of money later in perhaps overbuilding something. So it's it's just not an acceptable 
response. So I commend the staff for continuing to push on this and being very clear in your request to the applicant in terms of what they need to do. Not only, I mean, they need to do their work so we can do our work. So thank you again for your efforts on that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner White. I uh, I think you said it beautifully, you know, and, and Commissioner Trueblood also, how can we do our jobs in protecting Capper Crampton land if we don't have the information uh, that the submitting agency uh, uh, is, is uh, considering uh, to minimize the impacts that we're here to protect in those parklands. Um, I, I really want to uh, commend the collaboration that's gone on between us and the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission uh, because uh, they are also, in effect, they would be the applicant for this to our commission. And um, so our work with them to uh, continue to be clear about our sort of line in the sand, which I think has been drawn going back to the very beginning in July of 2019. I think we were clear about many of these points. And I think part of what we're hearing is a, a significant frustration from the commission on, uh, in effect, uh, Commissioner Wright used the word resistance. I don't, I don't know if that's the same word I would use, but we are not feeling like we have been listened to in terms of our needs, our considerations, and these are legitimate um, under the one federal decision process. So um, I'm not going to repeat the items that I think we've already um, extensively discussed. I think there's been a comprehensive review and um, we're now at, a, at this inflection point of making it very clear that we cannot allow this to move forward without this information. Uh, and so as I, uh, and so what I'd like to do is two things. I'd like to first ask um, uh, Ms. Sullivan and Mr. Weil to review any additional comments that you heard that came out of this mm -hmm. uh, to, to now. And then secondly, uh, I want to uh, uh, also emphasize that uh, we will be drafting this letter uh, in response prior to the closing the comment period. And uh, I will be reviewing that letter to represent the commission with with staff's work. Uh, so any any additional comments that you'd like to add right now? Hi, this is Diane. Uh, yeah, I would just jump in and say it sounds like there is concurrence for the comments that we've drafted so far. However, uh, we definitely need to underscore the need to continue evaluating the MD 200 alternative. Um, and also the this issue of the changing patterns in commuting and the long lasting effects. Uh, and I think tied to that um, with what Commissioner White said and the need for additional or supplemental EIS in the future, because as we start to look at what the long lasting impacts are, um, I think we're on solid ground saying that an additional analysis is, is going to be necessary. Um, and then finally, uh, the other comment that we did not have in there, um, Commissioner Trueblood, the cultural assets piece of this, um, that that needs to, you know, they need to take a, a deeper look at that. And um, we'll also be reporting back to you on what the analysis has been done uh, to date, so. One question, um, Ms. Sullivan, will we be referencing the one federal decision process and our um, obligation and uh, authority to request additional information as Mr. Weil has suggested? Will that be part of the letter also? We, it can, and we have done that before. That was actually in a previous letter that we wrote to them, so. Uh, Mr. Weil, anything you'd like to add at this point? Uh, no, no, no further comments from me. 
uh, it was clear to me that that we just need to reframe this as basically we require them to analyze the Maryland 200 alternative based on, you know, this new world we live in. Uh, and, and if we didn't, if the state highway administration did not uh, think, you know, we had as much of an argument before the pandemic, before Purple Line, we should certainly use these additional kind of planning uncertainty factors uh, to, to really require this uh, as a full build option. So that's kind of what I heard and what the tone of the letter should be. Yeah, I think a, quite a stern one. And as I noted earlier, I will review this letter uh, before it's sent. So I look forward to working with staff on that. Um, so with that, I think this concludes our October 1st commission meeting, our seventh virtual meeting. Uh, the commission's next reg regular meeting is uh, scheduled for Thursday, November 5th, 2020. Uh, if there's no other further business, the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.